Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to Citrix Converge. And please welcome your host for today, Vice President of Workspace Ecosystem and Analytics, Steve Wilson. Welcome, everybody. Got a couple more seats down front here. Come fill in. Uh, we've got, it looks like a completely full house. Uh, I heard from the registration desk, we've had people trying to sneak in. Um, so, uh, so exciting to have you all here. So let me start off by welcoming you to Citrix's first developers conference. Come on. So we have people from all over the world here today. Um, how many people here are from the US? Raise your hand. So we got a lot of people from the US. How many people though came from as far away as say the East Coast? We got a, we got a lot of people here. Uh, how many people here do we have who came from Europe? Look at that, we got a big European contingent. Um, how about Australia? <laughs> um, it's amazing, right? So we already have a, a global community going on here for um, developing on top of these new technologies. And so this is a really exciting time. You are all part of this community now. This conference is for developers by developers. There are people here from all of the development teams. This is an international team from Citrix as well. We brought in folks from the UK, the Czech Republic. You'll get to meet them all and I'll introduce you to them in a bit. Um, PJ, who you'll meet in a bit if you haven't met him. Um, both of us, um, we don't get to write a lot of code these days, but we both started our careers as engineers uh, for companies that sold Unix workstations, if that dates us at all. Um, him at DEC and me at Sun Microsystems. But this is a developer event. And so we are going to get our hands wet. We are going to roll up our sleeves. Um, I'm gonna do it non-ironically here. But this is an event where we're not just going to talk at you. There is gonna be some presentations this morning to get level set and get you familiar with the basic concepts but I see everybody brought their laptops, which is good, because you will be writing code by mid-morning. And um, we expect everybody to leave here with the basic skills that they're gonna need to code against this new workspace platform. A uh, couple words for you on that. This is pre-release software. Um, you are the first people to ever get to code against this. And I don't just mean outside of Citrix. There are actually a number of Citrix people here because most people at Citrix have never had access to this outside of the core dev team. Um, so you are early. Um, will you find some bugs while you're here? I guarantee it. If you do, let us know. Um, I'll show you some of the places that you can let us know. I'll show you some of the places you can get help. Um, but on the other hand, you have the potential to have huge influence on the future direction of this platform that we're building. Um, you are here at the ground level. You are gonna get to meet the people defining the platform, building the platform, interact with them for the next two days. Um, welcome to the community. On the business side, we believe this is a big opportunity. We believe this is a big opportunity for Citrix and that's why we've invested so much in it. But we believe this is a big opportunity for all of you. Um, when we put together the conference, we looked broadly at three categories of developers who might be interested in coming and working on this with us. Um, independent software vendors, people who make packaged or cloud-based software and sell software for a living. And we'll talk about how you can integrate the systems that you're building using the workspace platform to bring them to customers in new ways. Uh, systems integrators and consultants. Uh, this may be the, off the bat one of the biggest opportunities to work with Citrix technologies that there's been in years or decades. Um, customers are really excited about the opportunity to adopt these platforms, but this is not a drop-in turnkey thing. And as you'll see, integrating in the back-end systems, some of them are going to be public SaaS systems that we at Citrix can build integrations to. Nine out of 10 of them are gonna be custom applications behind someone's firewall and people are gonna need help. 
Um, and also, if you are a customer, a corporate developer, again, we know you guys have custom applications, legacy applications built in different generations on different technologies. So there's a huge opportunity to improve there. So to start talking about the opportunity here, I'm gonna bring up Fouad. Fouad is a vice president from our CTO's office. Fouad was also the co-founder at Safo, which is a company that we acquired last year on which a lot of the technology is based here. So Fouad's gonna introduce you to the problems that we're trying to solve. Come on up, Fouad. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to see such a, a big audience here to talk about um, the future of work. And the thing about the future of work is that the future of work needs to start today. We need to start thinking about the future today because you know this, I know this, work sucks. Work is broken. You look around your office and I'm sure you see people every day that are punching the clock, not engaged, not trying to make a difference, not aligned with your goals. And a lot of that is because the way work happens today sucks. Gallup runs a state of the workplace poll. They pulled 31 million people. And here's what they found out. 70 plus percent of employees are not engaged with work. They're not happy to be at work. One out of six are actively disengaged. They hate working. They're trying to destroy their organization from within. That's horrible. That's horrible. And we have a chance to change that with the work that we're doing here on this platform. Now, when we talk about the future of work, when we talk about fixing work, we cannot do these things unless we understand what the essence of work is, okay? Now, a lot of people, when they think about work, they think about this generic big bucket, capital W work. But when you actually look at work and unbundle work and understand what people are doing over the course of their day, you're gonna find two big buckets of work. On one side, you've got that repetitive, structured, busy work. And every one of us has to deal with this stuff. Every one of us, you guys who flew here from Australia, who flew here from Europe, have fun doing your expense reports when you go back. Have fun spending two or three hours of your lives putting receipts into a stupid system. Okay, each one of us, we spend 17 hours a week doing email on average. And most of that work is garbage. It's not productive, it's not creating any value. Copying and pasting, some research came out. Do you know how many times you copy and paste a day on average? 134 times a day. We are copying and pasting, basically muling information from one system to the other because this type of work stinks, okay? When people talk about learning at the office, most of it's compliance related. I'm taking two hour courses so that I can find out that I shouldn't steal money from the company, okay? That's the repetitive structured busy work. The other bucket, unstructured creative work. Each one of us has a different set of unstructured creative work that we do. For you guys, it's probably writing code. It's probably inventing architectures. It's thinking about workflows. For people like me, it's coming up with boring PowerPoint presentations and writing reports for my boss. But every one of us has these awesome moments of work where we get to tap into our skill set. We get to tap into our creativity. We get to do kind of brainstorming, whiteboarding sessions. Okay? We get to go and do some type of learning that actually advances our career. And the thing about these things is that we know, because we measure, these things on the left are soul-sucking and horrible, and these things on the right are engaging. Now, when you think about why people work, and what we're trying to get out of work, okay? The research shows that people want three things out of work, okay? We want some autonomy. We don't wanna be micromanaged. We want some sense of purpose. We wanna know what we're doing matters. But here's the big one. We want to master a skill. We want to grow as professionals. We wanna increase our level of craftsmanship because that's what makes us special. That's what makes us unique. That's why we show up to work every day, right? We're trying to get better at what we do. But when you look at where people are spending their time today, and you think about those two buckets of work, 85% of our time is spent on this soul-sucking, busy work. People say they spend 54% of their time every week doing boring emails that don't add value, doing those 
TPS reports, expense reports, PTO reports, writing somebody's review, inputting data into some form fields, trying to find information across different systems. We spend 15% of our time every week in meetings. And if you're a manager, you know that that's more like 40%. And 90% of those meetings are wasted, okay? What does that leave for us to work on the creative, fun stuff that we're hired to do, the things that can actually help us develop as professionals? Not that much time. Where do we want to spend our time? Well, I can tell you this, and you guys know the answer to this. We want to spend our time working on the unstructured work. We want to spend our time being creative. We want to spend our time developing our skill sets and becoming better professionals, okay? And what's sad is that our employers also want us to spend our time doing that. When you think about your job spec when you were hired, I guarantee you it didn't say, must be awesome at Concur Travel. Must know how to be good at annual reviews and workday. That is not the skill that you were hired to do. You were hired because you're probably a great developer. Your employer hired you because you're a great developer. But they've created an infrastructure that sucks your time away into things that don't create value. And so we think and we say, what is standing in the way of enabling us to make work better, okay? And the answer is pretty simple. We have horrible employee experiences. We have antiquated employee experiences. We have processes and workflows that make no sense. We've got systems that make no sense. We've got cultural norms that aren't obvious to people for how we should collaborate and be creative. Now, sometimes people's eyes roll into the back of their heads when I talk about experience because you think it's this soft, lame, you know, oh, touchy-feely, you're developers, we like math, that's great. But what I'll tell you is that employee experience is actually a very discreet thing. MIT has spent a lot of time trying to understand what is employee experience. And employee experience is your reality. It's the day-to-day -day reality of your work, and it's defined by four things, okay? The tools that you have to work with, the processes and workflows that become the order of operations for how work gets done, behavioral norms, how do we collaborate, how do we create things together, and the physical environment, okay? Everything you do over the course of your day is gonna to touch one of those four things or two of those things working together, okay? Now, when we think about the future of work, when we think about how can we, as a group, make work better, okay? This is the key formula. Employee experiences will drive employee engagement and employee productivity. A better employee experience will create more employee engagement and more employee productivity. Now, sometimes people conflate engagement and productivity, but they're two very different things. Engagement's this idea that every morning I wake up and I've got like 100 units of life energy, and I'm gonna decide how much of that I bring to the party every day, okay? On a day like today, oh, great, I'm gonna talk to people, I'm gonna bring 80 units of energy to work. But you guys know, when you're demoralized at work, when you hate your boss, when you see processes that make no sense, when you know that you're gonna have to battle bureaucracy over the course of that day, you're not gonna bring 80 units of, work to, of energy to work that day. Maybe you'll bring 10, maybe you'll bring 15. That's a different concept than productivity. Productivity is the economic output from each of those units of energy. And here's what we know from the work we've done over the last six years at Sappho and for the last year here at Citrix. When you deliver a bad employee experience, when technology is standing in people's way of spending time on the work that they want to do, well, you're gonna have demotivated employees who are not productive. Conversely, if you can deliver a good experience, if technology and IT is abstracted away and becomes wind in your sail, well, guess what? Now people are spending more time on the work that they love. And they're gonna be more engaged. And they're gonna be more productive. Now, here's the really cool thing. Engagement and productivity amplify each other. The combination of engagement and productivity is what yields your economic contribution. And again, these are things that we are measuring right now in the field. So let's go back to our bad experience and good experience. For my bad guy, well, you know, he's only bringing three units of energy to work at a half an economic output. Well, guess what? When I bring nine units of energy to work and I'm actually helping people get work done so they're more productive, there's a 12X multiplier. 
when you can deliver a good experience versus a bad experience. Now I want you to take this formula one step further and think about over the course of your career at an employer. The typical millennial is working 22 months at a company right now. It takes 12 to 18 months just to onboard somebody to full productivity. If you can create great employee experiences, guess what? People will stay longer. So let's go back to our example of bad experience and good experience. Well, if instead of somebody staying two years, they stay four years, look at the amplification that we see here on economic value that can be created for an employee. In a world where we're chasing marginal gains, where people are trying to find 1% here and 3% here and 2% here, we're talking about a 24X multiplier on what you can get from an employee because they're excited about working. And before you say, ah, oh, Fuad, you're crazy. 24X, that's nuts. There's so much academic research out there that shows these exact numbers are real. For developers, and you guys probably know this better than I do, the academic literature shows that an engaged developer will generate 16 times the contribution of a disengaged developer. 16X. Now, when you have these types of order of magnitude opportunities available for you, that's the opportunity to build a platform. Because one company is not going to be able to capture all that value. It's just not possible. You need an ecosystem of people that are working together to help make that vision possible. And that's what we're going to be doing here over the next few days. We're going to be defining the future of work together. Now, you'll remember processes and workflows. A lot of companies don't have the flexibility to just rip and replace IT tools. Okay? <clears throat> Changing cultural norms is not something that we're going to do together anytime soon. Nobody here is going to change the layout of an office. But what this group is capable of doing is looking at wacky, crazy workflows that are getting in the way of employees and reimagining them. And this is our goal. Our goal is to help flip the script. How do we take away these pains that eat up people's time and abstract them away, make them disappear into the background? How do we help turn IT tools into wind in people's backs so that they can be the best version of themselves? Now, I'm really excited to introduce this next speaker, PJ. PJ has seen this movie before. Not many of us have seen this movie before. PJ has not only seen this movie before, he's directed this movie before. Okay? PJ was there when SharePoint was invented. I think he was one of the inventors of SharePoint, and he ran it at Microsoft. Now, PJ tells me his first developers conference for SharePoint had 40 attendees. So, Steve, and the team, good job. We have beat SharePoint. <laughs> Always important to beat other people. Now, when PJ thinks about building a platform and a developer ecosystem, that means he needs to create a system that's going to create more value for the ecosystem than it does for the company. And when you think about a SharePoint, when SharePoint did a billion dollars of revenue for the first time, the ecosystem did $7 billion of revenue. And that's what we're trying to build here at Citrix. So with no further ado, PJ Huff, Huck. Thank you, man. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you, Fouad, for that <laughs> introduction. Uh, you remembered more things from my past than maybe I'd even forgotten myself. Um, uh, if you have SharePoint questions, I've Actually, I'm no longer on product support. Uh, 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 you, you know, the, I think the important thing as we move into the day is that you realize that we've actually done quite a lot of research that backs up what we're trying to uh, deliver here today. And you know, as I think ominous as some of the statistics were that that uh, Fuad shared, they also shared, I think, an optimism around you know th these phase shifts that we sometimes see in our industry when new platforms emerge and just how dramatic they can be beyond our wildest dreams uh, that really can change the shape of our industry. And uh, that, that's, that really is our ambition. Um, you know, 
I think there are very real examples in our lives every day, you know, when we think about our interactions with technology that really show that it's not just complex systems like SaaS applications that have actually emerged to be confusing to users. If you think about the basic act of, of even just copying a document um, on a photocopier and the clutter of that device, the one magical thing that they've done on almost every photocopier is add that big green button. It turns out that's the 99% use case. That's, uh, and in fact, if I need two copies, I usually push it twice because uh, that's easier than figuring out how to do multiple copies on a copier. Um, we've built applications that look a lot like this, except we haven't put the green buttons in. And users now struggle with interfaces that are complex, that are different as you move from one to the next, uh, and that really don't uh, engage the user in a way that helps them be productive. And if you think that I'm talking about old green screen applications, and uh, three-tier apps that were built a, a decade ago, I would just encourage you to sort of glimpse at this next video sequence of our good friend Maria Berman and how she moves through a set of modern applications today to get her job done. And what you realize is, is that as she goes from Workday to Concur to email to Slack, that in fact, life may have changed a lot, but that doesn't necessarily mean as a user it's gotten a lot better. Uh, small things like where she has to click on the screen to get things done. Is the approve button in the bottom left? Is it in the upper right? Why is it orange and not green? As I move between these apps, I get distracted because there's notification engines that are popping up. I get queries from people that they should have been able to resolve themselves by looking at information that was targeted at them. But instead of that, no, I'm acting as their workflow engine. I'm not only managing my own work, but I'm also sourcing information for other people because it's different, difficult. And the apps that are uh, being showcased here are all apps that I think we're proud of as an industry. They are the latest versions of Salesforce and Concur and ServiceNow. Um, but the experience of moving between them is actually very complex. And for those of us that are deeply engaged in the software that we work with on a daily basis, you can imagine that this isn't really an obstacle for us. But to the statistics that Fouad pointed out, think about the employee who's just trying to get their work done. This is a major impediment. What we see, even despite all of our investments, is that the average user on an average day will tell you that they see too many apps, they have to switch too frequently, and they don't get depth of use out of any of them. And so this is sort of the state of enterprise software as we think about it today. And maybe if that was our employees' only interaction with technology, maybe we could get away with it. But the reality is that's not what they're dealing with in the rest of their life. What they have in their hand in their personal life is a device that has addressed many of these things and a set of platforms and tools that really have advanced the state of the art of what I think of as consumer software in a way that's not yet impacted enterprise software. Let's talk about some of the principles that we see in some of these applications. The first one is this idea of an integrated feed. Uh, and it's not just a way to present information to me, it's actually a way to organize it. It's targeted at me, it allows me to subscribe to things that matter to me, but it's also a way for information to get pushed to me that really matters in a timely manner. Second of all, we're all used to notifications, real-time notifications in the moment. Now is the time to leave for the airport, PJ. Uh, think about that. I didn't get notified you know, when it didn't make sense. I got notified when it mattered, when I needed to do something about it. Um, clear actions. Book the ticket, reserve the hotel room, change the flight. Think about how all of these experiences are now just at the point of attention of the user in their hands. Uh, and then think about all the ways that when we engage with these systems, they get better and better over time. So whether it's a virtual assistant or it's AI, or it's the more we search, the better the, the search engine gets, or the more we you know, have voice interaction, the better the system gets. This is really, I think, the world that users are expecting now when they show up at work. And that millennial 22-month-on-the-job, 
I can tell you one of the things that happens as we walk people through our offices here and try to hire them is people are surveying the environment. They're looking for evidence that the company they're joining is modern in the way that it treats employees, in the tools it gives them, in the environment it has, in the cultural norms of the organization. Do you have flex work, et cetera, et cetera. So these things have become table stakes for that next generation of employee engagement and employee retention. So we've always seen some flavor of this problem here at Citrix, delivering wide variety of disconnected applications. And we've really built our workspace strategy around helping to organize those disparate applications and provide a set of capabilities that wrap all of them and that help deliver them in a consistent way to users. So in some respects, we've been on this journey with the workspace for some time, unifying apps along with content, delivering it across all the devices, and providing the same infrastructure with regard to security and compliance, analytics, and the delivery mechanism for, for all those apps. That you can think of as step one. Really, the direction that we're moving now is to actually intercept work and guide it. We don't just want to deliver those monolithic applications. We think we can use them and deliver a platform on top of it that allows you to build solutions that are tailored to the work that people are trying to do with the applications. And ultimately, we think we can move beyond guiding work to automating work. Before I move on, I want to tell you a brief story about an airline that I met recently. Um, uh, they told me that a customer had arrived at the check-in desk with his daughter, and he said, hey, I'm traveling with my, my, my daughter. We booked our tickets separately, um, but we're not sitting together. Can you actually get us to, you know, two seats together? And the check-in uh, assistant said, yeah, sure, I can. Give me your phone. And he took the customer's phone, and he used the mobile app from the customer's side to put the seats together because it was easier to do than the app he had on his side with backslash star foo bar thing to actually rearrange the seating. And it's the same company. Think about it. They built both experiences. They gave one to their consumer, their, their paying customer. They gave the other one to their employee, who's supposed to be delivering a great experience to those customers. And to me, this is a great example of the divergence that's occurred in the infrastructure between what we as consumers see on the outside and what employees often see on the inside. It shouldn't have to be that way. We should be able to intervene on behalf of those employees and create an uplift in the experience that they all have inside the organization that's much more on par with what's delivered to, to customers. And I think, as I said, we've seen the benchmark. We know what it can do. We know what it can look like. So let's take a look at the workspace. For those of you not familiar with it, you'll be interacting with parts of the workspace later today. So I think it's worth a little tour through the user experience so you get a sense for what we're uh, talking about. So um, let me just walk through the, the critical elements, some of which you'll get to use today and some of which will come online later in future uh, developer uh, previews that we have. The first thing is integrated assistance and search. We know that a lot of people inside a workspace are looking for not just an app, they're looking for an answer to a question. And we're going to actually have a full um, a, a machine learning backed assistant that sits in here that not just finds content, but can also interact with systems of record to answer pointed questions. How many days of vacation do I have left? Um, how are we doing on the Q3 sales? Uh, so think about all those inter interactions with the system of record that are actually often questions that we have ourselves or that we need to answer on behalf of other people. The second thing, and the, I'll call it the showcase, the centerpiece in the workspace, is that personalized feed. This is where we take those extracts from all the applications that I deal with on a daily basis, and we deliver out of those applications the pieces I need to interact with in order to do my job. If I am not an expert in Concur, then I probably just use it to approve expenses or to submit new ones. That's probably the only capability or functionality I need. Similarly, if I'm not the ServiceNow help desk, I'm probably just either generating tickets or checking to see that they're resolved. Um, not, I don't need the rest of the app on a daily basis. 
And so what you see here is the viewport into the interesting parts of the application that allow me to quickly understand what the company is hoping that I accomplish today to get that busy work out of the way, get that 15% taken care of so I can go back to the 85. The third uh, part of the interface, and you'll see this show up in several uh, of the narratives that we have in the workspace, is a set of recommended actions. And recommended actions can be based on lots of things. My job role, my location, maybe the day of the week, maybe my pattern of work. What are the things that the workspace believes are things that I might need to do or should be the next best thing for me to focus on? This is powered by machine learning and AI on the back end and based on observing behavior of users. Uh, but you can tell this has the potential to really help users quickly get from a task to the next thing that they need to go deal with. Of course, it's a workspace, so it has access to the things that really matter, my apps, my content, uh, my desktops, if, I'm, if I have a remote desktop, et cetera. So none of that goes away. It's all here. It's just not presented as the first thing to click on. Maybe I do need to go into Concur. I have deep work to do in the application. I can get to it. But if all I need to do was approve the expense, let's, let's put that front and center first. We're also building micro apps. And you'll be doing some of this later today, which are deeper integrations with the application that surface the necessary data for me to have confidence that I can complete the task. In the case of a sales report, I probably want to see some of the details. In the case of an expense report, I may want to see all the line items in the expense, et cetera. And so building these experiences that go beyond just that, uh, you know, that card that has the, the, the front information, allowing you to build these deeper experiences here inside the workspace. This is actually one strategy for thinking about how to modernize the experience of an application without re-architecting the whole application from the ground up. And finally, we believe that the capabilities that we're building, the core platform capabilities, are not just constrained to being inside the workspace itself. We're building an omni-channel approach to the platform, which means that the capabilities of the workspace can surface, and we expect them to surface, in other places. In this case, uh, I am sending information from my workspace to Microsoft Teams to share with other people. And inside that Teams environment, I'll have a rich view of the information that came from the workspace. So whatever your collaboration platform is or the cultural norm in your organization for, for sharing and collaborating, it's really important that we integrate with those, uh, whether it's Teams or Slack or email, whatever it is that you decide, or SharePoint, uh, you decide uh, is the place where people go to, to see shared work and collaborate together. So that gives you a sense of some of the big building blocks that we have. Not all of them are available for customization today in the workspace, uh, but I think you get a sense for the foundational elements that we're building into the workspace that will allow us to deliver new types of solutions. I wanted to take a moment um, to talk a little bit about, about platforms and wh why what we're doing is different than just building an app. Um, we've delivered an app in the past, the Workspace app. And the app, I would say, was very opinionated about the content that it should display, where things were laid out, uh, and how the user interacted with the app. Um, in reality, the Workspace app actually tried to get out of the way and let you get at the apps and the content. That was really the primary goal. In this case, we're taking a very different approach. We're building a new platform that has new capabilities, capabilities that we think simplify building modern applications. And what we see happen in our industry is the opportunity for a platform emerges when you see multiple apps reinventing the same set of capabilities and building it in an embedded way inside their own framework. So it turns out that everybody has some way of subscribing to notifications. Everybody has some way of doing some kind of recommendation or assistance inside their app. But it is bound to their app. 
It is not in the platform. And as a result, the apps are moving more slowly than we would like. And they're actually diverging because people are implementing these common capabilities in divergent ways inside the apps. And so our goal is actually to extract a set of those capabilities from the individual apps, deliver them in a common platform, and it allow you and the community to run fast and build a set of apps that take advantage of those capabilities. What you're going to see later today also is that we're not just delivering the user experience, we're actually delivering a developer tool, that micro app builder, that allows you to compose these applications. And you'll get some time to uh, play with that, that builder to later today. Of course, the builder is part of the product, and everything that Steve said about early versions and not many people having seen it, it's equally true for the builder as it is for the underlying platform. Um, but I think you get a sense of, of the level of investment we're making uh, to really up-level this platform conversation and um, enable you to build that next generation of enterprise applications. OK, enough with the slides and we're talking about this. I'm delighted to bring to stage Jay Tomlin, who's going to do a workspace demo for us and show us the user experience and the builder. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, PJ and others. Uh, give me just a sec to get plugged in. Be in good shape, Don. All right, here we go. So as PJ described, what we're building is a platform to deliver a great work experience that's gonna ultimately improve the user's engagement, improve their productivity, and raise their contribution and lifetime value. So as a user, the first place that I'm going to interact with this is in the workspace. Sorry, we lost our video. All right, let's try that again. So I'm logging onto the workspace as Paul here. And this is the, the new version of the workspace. It's not yet released, but it should look somewhat familiar. It's still an aggregation point for applications, desktops, and content, everything that the user needs to be productive in their role. And that's really an essential uh, hook that we can bring to the table. We, we're already connecting users to their applications. Uh, at the end of the day, the user just needs to get something done. The reason they need to launch that application is because they've got a job to do, and the application might be the best place to do that, but if it's a simple atomic workflow, uh, perhaps we can make it better, prevent them from context switching, uh, not require them to launch so many apps to get things done, and provide a, a more streamlined user experience, not just on the desktop, but also on their mobile device. So what you see, uh, to orient you to some of the new vocabulary and elements in the user experience here, we have this activity feed, which includes notification cards. And each card is a, a notification that was generated by the event engine that, uh, that you'll be seeing and, and working with. This list of activity or notifications can be sorted by date and time. So the latest ones go up on the top. Or we can also sort by relevance. And over time, we'll learn better what is most relevant for the user. And um, you can tell this is real, <laughs> real code because we're hitting some production issues here. Let's try refreshing. And we lost the video again. Let's try a different. Uh... Back. Okay. Uh, you can also sort by relevance, which is going to show you the, the, the items that are actionable and things that are most relevant to you. When I click on one of these cards, what I'll see is a micro app page. Uh, we, we also refer this to the, as the, the blade that slides out. But the page content that you see here is something that you can design in the builder. And here's an example of a, a company announcement. A new employee just joined. Uh, this is typically something that happens in email and blows up your inbox. Uh, but it's much um, uh, more elegant just to send that out as a notification. I can dismiss that card and not have to uh, deal with that in my email. 
Now, some of the notifications will have actions on them. So here's an example of a new course that's available that I can register for. And I can either register for that course uh, after reviewing the, the details in the page here, um, take the action there. And again, because the workspace has my identity, it's able to make a request to the backend system that manages the courseware. Uh, that was an API call to add my name to the, the course list. Uh, there also may be uh, examples where there's enough information on the card to take action right away without even opening the blade. And so you may see buttons that show up on the card themselves. Uh, you can just take care of that, approve the expense report, uh, approve the PTO request if you're a manager, and uh, the task is done in the back end system. Now the, the notifications feed shows you um, items that have occurred, that there's some uh, activity that you need to be notified about. Uh, there's also cases where, as a user, I want to initiate an action. And let's say I, uh, I just have a, a new employee joining, and I want to order a new monitor for her so that when she arrives at her desk, she's got a nice new 24-inch monitor, 24 inch monitor uh, to work with. Now, at my company, I think it's ServiceNow that handles those types of requests. But if I go look at ServiceNow, um, it's frankly a little confusing as to where to even begin in order to create a ticket to, uh, to request that, that purchase. Um, so that's the kind of thing that an action in the workspace can help with. Uh, an action is an atomic unit of work that is extracted from an application that will allow the user to get something done quickly without necessarily needing to launch the full application. And in this case, I'll, I'll use the uh, submit problem action that's backed by ServiceNow but I didn't need to launch ServiceNow to do it. I'll just put in a short description. Please order a new monitor for, I got some typos in there, that's, that's great, <laughs> um, for Paula. All right, so I'm hitting submit on that problem. Once again, we've got the user's identity. It says that request will be processed by ServiceNow. Now, if I go back to the system of record, which is ServiceNow, uh, you can actually see that as now submitted as a new item. And so that can kick off the, the workflow for procurement and uh, IT to get the, uh, get the ball rolling on providing that. That's, so that's an example of pushing information to a system of record. Uh, we will have out-of-the-box integrations for a number of the most common systems of record, like ServiceNow, Salesforce, Concur, Workday, um, uh, and others. The, the other piece that uh, we want to do is, is pull information from the system of records so that when something changes, if I get assigned to a ticket, for example, uh, I want to get notified about that. So here's a, another ticket. Um, it's number 4049. We need an additional license for Jira Cloud. And what I'll do is I'll assign that to Paul and update that in service now. So imagine a, an IT admin went and assigned a ticket to me. Um, I would expect to see that as a notification in my workspace, right? So, since, uh, since something changed, that, that change would affect me. Um, to help you understand how this works, I want to switch over to the, the, the admin view. Uh, this is our Citrix Cloud control plane. How many of you are familiar with uh, Citrix Cloud already? Good. So this is the, where, where I would configure all of the applications for my, uh, my, my workspace tenant for things like single sign-on, content collaboration, virtual apps and desktops, if you're using that. Um, to power this new experience, we will be introducing a new service in, in Citrix Cloud called the Micro Apps Service. So you see that tile here. I'll go and uh, begin by managing Micro Apps. The Micro Apps Service allows you to add new integrations, either for the common SaaS apps that we will have turnkey integrations ready for, or you can add your own custom integration based on web services um, or, or other ways to um, inject your own custom application. Um, each integration can then have a set of micro apps. So you see I have Salesforce integrated here, and there's a collection of, of micro apps that surface those atomic units of work and those, those workflows that uh, we want to show up in the workspace. Um, each micro app will include things like notifications or actions. So in ServiceNow, there's a My Assignments micro app. And there are a number of different notifications that are included in this. These are all based on changes. So when uh, the, the workspace 
MicroApp service synchronizes and detects a change that's happened in ServiceNow, it will fire a notification based on the rules and the conditions that you set here. Uh, I'll take a quick look at one of these just to give you a, a preview. So we can see after a data sync interval, if there's a new record, then notify the user. And here's where you actually configure the user experience. So I'm gonna um, edit the card, put the icon, exactly what I want it to say, um, <coughs> insert variables with uh, uh, mustache braces there so that the, the experience is tailored for the user. So those are notifications. The micro app can also include pages, which is what you would see on that blade that slides out when you click an action or when you click on a, um, a notification card. Uh, you would see the contents of a page. And so I'm not gonna go deep into how to use the builder. Uh, the next session is up for that, but um, this is where it's all configured and what drives that user experience. Um, I've mentioned synchronizing. So for changes to surface in the, in the workspace experience, we do need to periodically synchronize with the systems of record. And this is a schedule that you can set on a per integration basis. Um, a full sync would bring down everything that you want to power your micro apps, and then there can be an incremental sync that occurs every once in a while after that. So I'll just do an incremental sync to pick up that recent change that I did for assigning the, uh, the problem to Paul. And what that should do is bring in the change from ServiceNow, trigger the notification, and add it to Paul's workspace. So I'll go refresh, give it a few seconds to flow through the system. Try right, one more time. I did click update, didn't I? Yep. Okay, so it may take a few more seconds for, the, for that to show up, but hopefully you get the sense that uh, this is how we're powering the experience. Um, workspace is one place for the user to consume that experience. We do want to be omni-channel, so we're we're gonna to continue to evolve this as a platform, not only for enabling you to add your own applications to integrate, but also enabling more types of user experience uh, inside and outside the Workspace app. Give it one more try just in case it's gonna work. Cross your fingers. Okay, something went wrong today. <laughs> but uh, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get a chance to uh, learn more about the builder and the Workspace um, over the course of Converge, and we really look forward to getting your feedback. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jay. Bugs are not how you know the code is real. Uh, so I am going to wrap this up. Um, I appreciate everybody being patient while we kind of level set this morning. Um, right after this, we're gonna start diving into architecture and get you guys ready to get hands on and start working with the builder and start writing code. So, um, so let's look at what we're gonna do the rest of the two days while you're here. So um, literally the next session at the top of the hour, uh, we're going to dive into the architecture, the extension points, set you up for what are the things you're gonna be able to do today as you go in to get hands on with this. Um, we're gonna have the team come up and give you an intro to the micro app builder. So what Jay showed there about being able to assemble your cards and your pages, synchronize with the backend systems of record. How's that gonna work? How do you expose an event? How do you expose a page? How do you trigger an action? Um, we're gonna walk through a hands-on lab. So the team's gonna come up and actually help you walk through, get you set up, get you guided, and then we've got sort of the step-by-step -step instructions. I think the sample here we settled on is we're gonna build an integration with Jira. Figured given this is a software developer audience, um, everybody knows how to use Jira and it's a nice clean cloud service with a modern interface. So it'll give you a really good picture of what it is to integrate a SaaS service into the workspace. And you'll get to do that end-to-end -end yourself. Um, after that, when we get into the afternoon, we're gonna have a hackathon. And really the idea here is, again, this is a roll up your sleeves event. Uh, you are going to get to dive in and try this. So, um, however, we're not leaving you to your own devices. Uh, we have a set of technical mentors um, here from the product development teams. They will be wearing these, these yellow vests. Uh, for those of you who will be wearing the vests, 
Um, put them on yourselves before assisting others. Um, the exits are here and here. But um, if you need help, there are going to be a set of folks. Um, if you're a technical mentor, you want to just stand up right now and wave. I know you're hiding in here. Don't be shy. Um, yeah, I think we have 10 named technical mentors from the development team. So any questions you have, any place you feel like you're getting stuck, uh, these folks are here to help, okay? You have the live engineers um, who know how it works. So during the hackathon, you guys can try anything you want. Um, there are some other samples. We have you know, a good sample for a couple different known to work paths if you wanna stay close till you're more comfortable. If you wanna run off the edge, go for it. If you run into a problem, let us know. Um, but the hackathon, uh, we really want this to be fun. So um, we do have some great prizes. You will get a, um, uh, if you win, um, a backpack full of cool stuff, battery packs, AirPods. Um, there's another big thing in here that's too big for me to pull out. Um, so there will be some time for hacking today as well as some time for hacking tomorrow. Um, and we'll get into it. But there's the opportunity for fabulous prizes. Um, uh, during the hackathon today, you know, we debated internally a lot about how much time should we have for hacking. If you're a developer, you know, four hours is barely enough time to get into it, but other people might want to be, I don't want to code straight for four hours. I'm, I'm here, I want to interact with people. So we've got some optional breakout sessions. Uh, our executive briefing center, if you walked in the front doors, you guys turned right to come in here. If you had turned left, you would be in the executive briefing center. So all of these sessions will be available during the hackathon time. If you wanna pop into any of them, they're first come, first serve. We have a room over there that holds about 30, so if a third of the people went over and checked them out, um, that would be great. Um, if we honestly do run into overflow with any of these, because they're oversubscribed, we can probably run one again tomorrow, so don't freak out if you don't get in. Um, you know, we know we have a lot of people here who are Citrix partners who do a lot of different uh, kinds of business with Citrix. You're here at a site where we have um, executives from different lines of businesses, different areas. If you're interested in having a half hour coffee conversation with a Citrix exec, uh, we would love to just sit down, have a cup of coffee, talk about whatever you want. If you're interested in doing this, just drop by the reg desk, let them know you're interested, tell them something about the topics you're interested in talking about. We will match make you with a Citrix exec and get you some time to chat. It's no strings attached. Day two agenda. Um, again, another packed day. Uh, uh, do show up for breakfast. We're gonna have a lot more Citrix folks coming down for breakfast, interact with you, um, mingle around, get you to know more people because you're here, uh, which is awesome. Uh, we're gonna have some more time for hacking um, with the mentors here to help. Again, we wanna make sure that you leave feeling like you really know how to do this and you have an environment that's configured and ready to go. Um, after that, we would love to have you guys come up and share some of what you've done. Um, again, part of this is building community. We'd love to share ideas, show off what you've done. Um, the ones that look the awesomest, um, using some different criteria, and we'll talk about that, will win fabulous prizes. Um, uh, in the afternoon, we'll get into kind of futures on SDK. PJ talked about there are some things we have today that you're gonna get hands on with. There are some things coming over the next months and even longer. We're gonna talk about directions we're going with that. Um, and we'll hand out some awards and we'll have some feedback too and I'll get to that in a second. Um, one of the things available on day two, again, um, big Citrix site, our briefing center across the way. We have every possible Citrix product over there that's downloadable. We have our demo experts over there. If there are any products you're interested in you want to ask about, or if you, as somebody who works with Citrix products, want some advice for how to demo one of these products, uh, go and talk to the guys. This will be open during the day two hackathon hours. Just drop in. So you're all part of the community now. We're excited to have you. Um, you're an insider. You're going to get access to the developer team. Uh, you were the first to experience this. Uh, we really want your feedback. And to that end, uh, this is a, a multi-channel feedback experience. 
Uh, hopefully everybody has gotten on the Slack channel by now. If you haven't, please do get on the Slack channel. Use it for help during the hackathons. Use it to communicate with each other. Um, use it to communicate with Citrix. Um, by the way, I've gotten this question. Uh, this is not an NDA event. Um, uh, we want you guys to share what you're learning here. Um, but you know, if you're having technical problems, your best support channel is probably not Twitter for today. It's the Slack channel. Um, the other thing that we have is what we're calling the advisory boards. We have some of our product researchers. They're over here in this corner and over here in this corner. Um, yeah, wave over there. Um, they would love to just chat with you. They've got some questions. Um, if you go over and chat with them, um, it's a good way to sort of influence the direction of the product. Um, no strings attached. Uh, the last one is um, sort of as we wrap up today, we'll be handing out some comment cards and things. If you fill those in, you actually, again, will be eligible to win some prizes. Now, one of the most treasured things at Citrix inside the company is the infamous Red Bull racing jackets. Um, uh, those of you from not the United States probably do follow Formula One. If you're not in the US, you should. It's really fun. Um, Citrix, the, the Red Bull Racing team has actually been a customer for a decade. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started sponsoring the team. Our name's on the side of the car. And uh, so I always feel like I'm part of the team, which is fun. These jackets are awesome. Um, we'll be giving away some of this if you participate in the feedback and the comments. So last thing before we get into it, uh, we will be having a party tonight. So. Um, Food, we got a cool food truck, we're gonna have games, all this other stuff setting up in the EBC, both indoor and outdoor. Grab your jacket, head over there. Um, should run about 5.30 to 8.30 tonight. And then we'll give you some time to go home, get some sleep, and, uh, and dive in in the morning. So again, welcome to Citrix Converge. Thanks for coming. We're gonna get the non-technical people off the stage now. We're gonna dive in and do some architecture and get ready to go. Thanks everybody.